How deep the Father's love for us. How vast we are the family. I hope that you are all well. Um, By the time you're uh, listening to this, I would be on leave. But it was my uh, desire to uh, share with you the last of uh, the attributes of God that we've been studying now for uh, a time. And uh, I really just wanted to spend some time with you thinking about this and bringing closure to this series. This evening, we will come to study an attribute. And if you have been Keeping notes, you'll probably know what this attribute is, but it's a a wonderful attribute as we think about the nature of God. It is the attribute of His love, His love. And I'll explain in just a little while uh, why I've chosen uh, to think about this particular attribute last of all. But I trust that you've had a a, a blessed Lord's Day Uh, on this day. I, I know that Lance Lawton would be preaching or has preached in the morning. And this evening, it's my privilege once again to bring you the Word of God. Let's pray together. Let's ask the Lord to bless us as we study His Word. And then we'll read from the Gospel of John. But let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you, Lord, for those words which we can utter. We thank you that you are our Father. We thank you, Lord, that as we relate to you, we do not do so merely being those at a distance, but we thank you, Lord, that we have an audience with you, not merely a formal one, but we thank you, Lord, that it is a familial relationship that we can know. We thank you that you are our Father. We thank you that you are our Heavenly Father. 
And while you are seated on your heavenly throne, while the angels uh, proclaim your goodness, we thank you, Lord, that we have the privilege of coming before you and, and crying out to you. We do pray, Lord, that as we uh, reflect upon this wonderful truth, we pray that you would not only uh, inform our thinking, but Lord, you would also warm our affections. We pray, Lord, that you would help us not merely to affirm that you are a God who loves, but we pray, Lord, that you would help us to experience your love. That it would not simply be something that we know at a distance, but something that we, which we know uh, in, a, in a wonderful and a special way. We do pray, Lord, that you bless our time together as we uh, close this Lord's Day reflecting on your word. We pray, Lord, that by your Spirit that uh, you would again impress these truths upon us, that your Spirit would indeed be the one who, who fills our hearts with this particular truth. And we pray, Lord, that as we think about your love towards us, that uh, you would propel us, Lord, to love each other, that you would help us to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, not simply in word, but in word and in deed. We pray that you would help us to be those who are part of a spiritual family. We pray that you would help us to care for each other as brothers and sisters, and that, Lord, you would help us to truly reflect those uh, New Testament imperatives, those one another uh, verbs that you would help us to do that, Lord. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, friends, this evening, I trust that you have your Bibles with you. We'll be spending quite a bit of time in uh, the gospel written by the Apostle of Love. Now, if you're familiar with your Bibles, you'll know that that is the Apostle John. And as a springboard text, as a text really to, to get our minds ticking over, I want to read from Jesus' high priestly prayer found in John 17. And I want to focus primarily on, on one verse, not even the whole verse, just a, a particular phrase found within here. In verse 24, uh, there Jesus uh, prays and he says, uh, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Now let's read this passage from verse 20 through to verse 26 so we can understand how that single verse functions in the broader context. So from verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, and that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be uh, one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love me. Uh, sorry, that, that you sent me and love them, even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I have made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known, that the love which you have, with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Amen. This is the word of God. Friends, this evening, as I've mentioned to you already, we come now to the last of our study on the attributes of God. And we could, of course, continue uh, reflecting on all the other aspects of God's nature and, and God's character. 
I say really that this is the last study on the attributes of God, uh, mainly because the book that I've been using, the, the two volumes that A.W. Uh, A. Tozer wrote on the attributes of God has come to an end. I've been using him as an outline. But uh, A.W. Tozer, as he writes this, uh, these two volumes, he leaves the love of God right until the end, and there's good reason for that. Uh, ourselves, very much like A.W. Tozer in his time, found that the love of God was being separated from all his other attributes. And the church, I think today, as well as in the time of A.W. Tozer, faced the danger of becoming unbalanced. D.A. Carson, at the turn of the century, really does reflect this kind of attitude. In the year 2000, D.A. Carson wrote a book entitled, The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God. The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God. Now, when you hear that title, you might be tempted to think that, that D.A. Carson has taken leave of his senses, that, that somehow D.A. Carson has lost sight of things. Now, we might say, if uh, he had written a book about the difficult doctrine of the Trinity or the difficult doctrine of uh, predestination, we might say, well, well, of course, those are, in fact, difficult doctrines. They are hard doctrines. They are emotionally difficult doctrines. In what way, then, could we say that the doctrine of the love of God is difficult? Well, friends, unfortunately, I'm sure you know that we live in a world where love has become a bit of a definition fluid term. Love has been stripped of its biblical foundations. Love has been divorced even from attributes of justice and holiness and sovereignty. The result of this separation is really a hodgepodge of ideas that's nothing more than a mangled mess. Love, we might say, is purely defined by the one who's receiving it. Jaya Packer, in his book, Knowing God, and, and we studied this book some years ago as a church. Uh, in that book, he has a chapter on the love of God, and he says that false ideas have grown up around the love of God like a hedge of thorns, hiding its real meaning from view. And it is no small task cutting through this tangle of mental undergrowth. And what he means by that is that love really means anything and everything in the world today. Nowadays, if you were to tell people that God loves them, it's unlikely that they would be surprised. Most people would say, well, of course God loves me. That's his job. He's like that. He's a God who should love. Well, besides that, besides God's own character, why shouldn't he love me? I'm a good person. Uh, I might not be the best person, but based on my own self-evaluation, I'm not all that bad. D.A. Carson, as he responds to this sort of attitude, he says, the love of God in our culture has been purged of anything that our culture finds uncomfortable. The love of God has been sanitized, uh, democratized, and above all, sentimentalized. The most dangerous results of this impact uh, of contemporary sentimentalized uh, views of love on the church is our widespread inability to think through fundamental questions that alone enable us to maintain the doctrine of God in biblical proportion and balance. Again, what he's saying there is that if we simply highlight the love of God above everything else, we face the temptation, really, of becoming unbiblical in our view of God. And so our task this evening it is for us to allow the Word of God to speak for itself. We must allow the Word of God to bring balance. The Word of God must bring clarity. The Word of God must untangle the hedge of thorns that surround the love of God. And as I said, 
we will be spending most of our time looking at uh, the writings of the Apostle of Love, the Apostle John. Now I want to unpack three uh, ideas, three main headings that will help us do this. The first is, as we think about the love of God, we must begin to think about the love of God as made known in the Trinity. So my first point is this, the love of God is made known to the Son. The love of God is made known to the Son. And we saw a glimpse of that in verse 24 of John 17. When Jesus prays, he prays for not just the disciples, but for all who would believe. And he says, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am. Why? To see my glory that you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. The expression of God's love is not first of all revealed to us in God's love for us, but the expression of God's love is expressed first of all amongst the members of the Trinity. We see this again, or at least we've seen this before, at the beginning of John's Gospel. Now, it's not immediately obvious to us, but at the beginning of, of John's Gospel in, in chapter 1, and in the very First verse, he says there, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, it's quite interesting here, because the word with, in verse 1, may mean, or may indicate proximity. So I might say uh, to you this evening, well, well, I have my cell phone with me, or I have my wallet with me, or that I have my pen with me. Now, all that I'm telling you in that instance is, is the proximity of these objects to myself. My, my cell phone is not somewhere else. It's not in the office, or it's not in the car. Uh, my pen is not on my desk. It is with me. But John here is not merely talking about proximity. He's not simply saying that uh, the Son of God was in close proximity to uh, God the Father. He, he's talking about more than that. Here, the word with in the original indicates direction. It is the word which, which re literally means toward. Uh, so we might read the first verse like this. In the beginning was the word and the word was toward God. The word here is, is not just indicating proximity, it's indicating intimacy. Uh, there is a, a deep sense of affection, of love, that God the Father has for God the Son. John is showing us here that even before creation was created, in eternity past, God the Father loves God the Son. God the Son loves God the Father. God the Father uh, faces towards the Son and delights in the Son. God the Son faces toward the Father and delights in the Father. There is a, a, a beautiful picture here of loving intimacy that exists amongst the members of the Trinity. And John, uh, throughout this letter, gives us glimpses or reminders of that truth. And so walking through just a few verses uh, to show you this. So in John chapter 3 and verse 35, uh, and just after that passage where Jesus has spoken to Nicodemus, he says there that the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. The Father loves the Son. Or in John chapter 5 and verse 19. In John 5 there we read, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the, whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. 
For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these he will, will he show him, so that you may marvel. Again, the Father loves the Son. Or, yeah, even further in John chapter 10, in that passage where Jesus reveals himself to be the good shepherd, he says in John 10 and verse 17, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. A beautiful thread that runs through the Gospel of John, that the Father loves the Son. This must be our starting point. We cannot first begin by trying to define love as it exists in culture and then sort of impose that onto Scripture. No, no, we must first begin by asking, how does God reveal His love even before we were created? In those passages, as we begin to summarize them and put them together, uh, we can see there that the Father demonstrates His love for the Son by showing Him everything. The Father in love gives all things to the Son. The Father loves the Son as He obediently offers Himself up for sin. The Son likewise says only what the Father gives Him to say because He loves the Father. The Son does what only the Father gives Him to do. The Son comes into the world as the sent one. The Son, we might say, demonstrates His love for the Father by His obedience. A beautiful tapestry here uh, of the love of the Father towards the Son and the love of the Son towards the Father. And this pattern of love, as is modeled between the Father and the Son, becomes the pattern for us as believers. As we are born again into God's family, as we are adopted into God's family, as we have a, a righteous standing uh, before Him, that love becomes ours as well. The love which the Father has for the Son is the same love which He has for us. That's why in 1 John 3, in that passage that Roger preached on last weekend, uh, there John writes and he says, Behold, what manner of love God has for us, that we might be called children of God, and so we are. Now in that passage, he's not speaking about some ethereal idea of, of love that makes us feel warm and fuzzy inside. What he is saying is that uh, the love that the Father has for the Son is the same love which He has for us. And as a result of that, we must honor Him just as the Son would honor the Father. Our relationship to God mirrors the relationship that Jesus has to His heavenly Father. So God, God's love, as we've been thinking about, is made known to the Son. To the Son. But secondly, God's love is made known through the Son. Now, I'm being very careful with my, my prepositions here. So, first of all, God's love is made known to the Son. In eternity past, uh, God's love was expressed in the Trinity. Uh, now, uh, as we step into the, uh, to the created order, God's love is made known through the Son. I'm thinking here of a text which is so familiar to you. You've probably memorized this. But John 3, 16 as Jesus speaks to Nicodemus, he says, Therefore God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. How does the world see God's love? How does the world look for evidence of God's love? Well, it is seen in the sending of His Son. Now, this is not some aimless sending. It is not some sending that we can again redefine and make it fit our own agenda. But God sends His Son into the world to deal 
with sin, to deal with our iniquity, to deal with our transgressions. You know, it's, it's so sad, isn't it, that in some churches today, God's love is seen like this sloppy emotion that is no different than a, a teenage affectionate fling. And sometimes, we need to be careful of this, sometimes the songs that we even sing, or even the songs that we listen to, sometimes it's indistinguishable from the kind of romantic love, the fickle romantic love that we see in the world around us. God's love is seen in sending His Son to deal with our sin. In love, God deals with the very thing that separates us from Him. And as Christ will die on the cross, God shows us just how terrible and how disgusting our sin is. And isn't it remarkable that the object of God's love in eternity past, the Son, becomes the object of God's wrath as the Son deals with our sin. There's an incredible reversal there, isn't there? And that's why I think it's so important that we began by thinking about the love of God that exists within the Trinity. God loves the Son. But at the same time, God sends His Son that He might be nailed to a cross. The, the Father who was once face to face with the Son in eternity past turns His face away from the Son because of the sin that He bears. And then, the objects of God's love, you and I, we are the ones who have broken God's law. We are the ones who have corrupt natures. We are the ones who really uh, deserve condemnation and banishment. But God says that through His Son, we have life. And this is why, A.W. Tozer, and even in our study of God's attributes, comes to the study of the love of God last. When we say, when we repeat the words here that John writes, for God so loved the world, we need to know who God is. We must know who God is. And that is why we spend time uh, recognizing that God is infinite and immense, that God is omnipresent and good and just and merciful, and that God is full of grace, that God is imminent, that God is holy and perfect. We spend time thinking about the fact that God is self-existent, that He is transcendent and eternal. He is omnipotent, immutable, omniscient. He is omnisapient, all-wise. He is sovereign and faithful. So when we read that God so loved the world, all those attributes need to be held in balance with His love. This God, this God loves. And He loves, not because we have anything in and of ourselves that's deserving of love. He loves us because He chooses to love. God draws a sinful humanity to himself because he chooses to do so. But he chooses to do so through his son. The gospel is a wonderful expression of God who does not owe anything to sinful mankind, giving the one whom he loves so that our sin may be dealt with. And this is why the New Testament writers so often point towards the cross as an expression of God's love. Just a few passages again from 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that 
we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Or the Apostle Paul, as he writes in Romans 5 and verse 8, there he says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now I want to pause here for a moment. And just to say, you may be listening to this message and you may be someone who's, uh, perhaps you're, you know you're not a, a Christian. Perhaps you're, you're digging into these things. You, you're someone who's inquisitive or curious about religion. You've he- heard about Jesus before. And you, you heard about his death on the cross. And you hear about God. And, and you think that, that, that you want to make yourself right with God. You feel as though uh, you need to spend time and, and you need to sort yourself out. Well, friends, you can't do that. As Paul says in in Romans 5, it's while we were still sinners. God's holiness demands that which is perfect. We can never be perfect. We can never go back and change our lives. But we can turn to the Son. We can turn to the one whom God has sent to die in our place. If you're thinking about Christianity and the gospel, I would simply say, look at Christ. Look at what Christ has done. That's where your gaze needs to be fixed. That's where your attention needs to be given. You must look at Christ. You must see God's love for Him, for the Son. You must see the intimacy which He has. And then see the object of God's love hanging on a cross so that your sin is paid for. And the way that we appropriate That forgiveness to ourselves is by faith. And you ought to pray. You ought to pray that God would give you that faith. That his Holy Spirit would affirm that in your life. See, God decrees the plan of salvation in eternity past. We cannot earn salvation. This is something which he determined to do. In the book of Ephesians, in that first Chapter, there we see that God the Father predestined us. He chose us before the foundation of the world. That God the Son is the perfect sacrifice, the spotless Lamb. And that God the Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. He applies redemption to our hearts. Now I want us to note at this point that the love of God is exercised towards individual sinners. God's love is not some vague expression of God's will toward everyone in general, but no one in particular. God's love has a a direct object. God loves His Son, but at the same time, God loves His people as individuals. And we see in the book of 2 Thessalonians, Paul celebrates this fact as he writes to them. So in Ephesians, sorry, in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13, uh, Paul says there, But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as firstfruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in truth. God saves us. As individuals, God works in our lives as individuals. Yes, He does so as a church, but He does so as individuals as well. That is why the biblical writers treat the love of God as a a wonderful thing. Something holy, uh, admirable, something praiseworthy, something even surprising. That the objects of His wrath would become the objects of His love. God's love is expressed through the Son. But finally, we come to our third point, and it is this that God's love is expressed by identifying with our welfare. God's love is expressed by identifying with our welfare. 
biblical Christianity rests upon a covenantal relationship that we have with God and God has with us. This relationship is grounded upon it. Its very foundation is built upon God's steadfast love for His people. And that's why uh, part of many of the, the grand theme of many of the Psalms is God's steadfast love towards His people. Now you and I, even as we are believers, even after you've come to faith, we still wrestle with sin, don't we? There are still times in our lives when, when we feel as though we, we cannot overcome a particular sin. We may struggle with a particular sin for a very long period. And we so often break covenant with God, don't we? But it's God's love for us endures forever. It endures our inconsistencies. It endures our inadequacies. God's covenantal love for us is not grounded in what we do, but it's grounded in what He did in Christ. But the, His covenantal love for us also means that He identifies with our welfare. Parents, if your child is in distress, if they've hurt themselves badly, perhaps they are needing to go to the hospital, perhaps you can imagine this, they've been hit by a car or something like that. Would you, in that moment, continue to be cheerful and carefree? Would you sort of say to yourself, oh, well, you know, it's just a a bit of blood, it's just a concussion, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll get over it. Well, of course not. You, you would do everything that you possibly can in order to help them in those moments. Moms, if you see your child going through great degrees of, of pain, you may even cry with them. You see, if you simply went about doing your business and you just sort of looked at your child lying out in the street on the floor, saw them fall out of a tree, break their arms, and if you just carried on doing whatever you were doing, there's something wrong, isn't there? You would question, rightly so, if you really do love your child. Well, in the same way, God loves His people. God loves those who have trusted in His Son. And so when we go through great trials and temptations, when, when, we, when we suffer in this world, God is not oblivious to those things. God knows our suffering. And God is the only one who can truly empathize with us in those moments of suffering. And just as a, as a parent reflects something of the heart of God when they care for their children in distress, God perfectly cares for us in our moments of trials. Now, don't get me wrong, we mustn't fall into the trap of thinking that God will just give us what we want, that God is somehow some uh, tooth fairy or, or some sort of magical wizard that will give us whatever we want and that he'll just comfort us through this life. No, we must remember that God's grand prerogative is his own glory and we see his glory by shaping us into the image of his son. But we do know that in that process, God will comfort us. God will always be near to us. God will be the one to lead us and illuminate our path. Again, J.I. Packer in his book, and I would encourage you to go and, and read that section again on the love of God if you have uh, that book, Knowing God. A wonderful encouragement. He says there, the New Testament sets forth the knowledge of the love of God, not as a, as a privilege for a favored few, but as a normal part of ordinary Christian experience. I think that's so, so crucial. Because sometimes we might fall into the trap of thinking, you know, God loves me only when I do something good. Or God loves me only when, when I read my Bible in the morning and at night and, and maybe during my lunchtime. No, no, no. God has set His love upon us. We're the ones who so often drift away, don't we? We need to trust Him. We need to lean on Him. 
that we might know his love. In our study on the attributes of God, one of the things that we have seen and seen consistently is that God is the highest good. That God is the holiest holy one. That he is the perfect judge. That he is the sovereign king over all things. And this evening we see the heart of God, don't we? And while God in all these other attributes is absolutely perfect, we get a glimpse into his heart. And we could spend so much more time thinking about this, but... Time doesn't permit us here. So many books have been written on this subject. But it's wonderful, isn't it, that God has chosen to reveal this to us in His Word. See, as we think about the Word of God, and even as we read from 1 John 1 earlier, the Word of God doesn't make God who He is. The Word of God is God's own self-revelation of who He already is. God is who He is from eternity past. And He reveals His nature to us because He loves us. And He wants us to delight in Him as the highest good. The love of God and the knowledge of God are companions in the Christian life. God's love for us is revealed in the scriptures. And we grow in our love for God through the scriptures. And we must not separate the two. We must not drive a wedge between love and knowledge if you desire to know the love of God more, and if you desire to love God more, then you must also desire to delve deeper into His Word. As we know more and more of Scripture, so we begin to see more and more of God's love for us. And that is why I think again the Apostle John as he writes to the church in Ephesus in 1 John 3, has an incredible exclamation there. With all these truths at the back of his mind, there he says, Behold what manner of love God has for us, that we ought to be called children of God. What a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful truth. And we must ask God that that truth would begin to burn in our hearts. That we would love him more, and as we love him more, that we would love one another more. So friends, let's pray together and ask the Lord to impress these truths upon our hearts. Our Father in heaven, We want to thank you that you love us. Even though we are so unlovable. There is nothing good in us. There is nothing delightful in us. There is nothing lovable in us. And yet, in your tender-hearted love and compassion, you choose to set your love upon your people. And we thank you that this comes to us through your Son, who makes propitiation for our sin. And the love that we receive as believers is the love which you yourself have shown towards your Son. What a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful reminder of these truths. And we do pray, Lord, that while we might affirm these things and while it, it is wonderful for our minds to, to wrap around these wonderful truths, we, we pray that by your Spirit, you would help us to know this love. And we pray, Father, that you would kindle 
the, the fire within our hearts into a flame, that, that the love which you have for us will be so realized within our spiritual walk with you that others who are about us will see the, will feel the heat, the warmth, the radiance of all that you have done in our lives. We do pray, Father, that you would continue to go before us. We ask, Lord, that, that you would help us in this world as we uh, experience so many trials and temptations. Thank you, Lord, that you are the one who, who, um, uh, who knows all that we go through, the one who sympathizes with us. And we pray, Lord, that you'd be gracious to us as we, as we think of these things and as we look to you. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.